Koinach, good day, fellow South Africans and citizens of the world. I've been looking around for salvation. I've been looking around for the truth. All around me I see frustration And I looked all over till I found you I sit and listen to your stories And you're telling me please don't worry Not in this world you should know And love and life is where you should go If you're looking for somewhere to go If you're looking for someone to know Good evening, fellow South Africans and citizens of the world, and welcome to tonight's live stream. And tonight we have uh, two regular guests on, and of course that is Muzi and Kozi and uh, Colleen Serfontaine, who of course is from the YouTube channel um, Skidmarks or Breakmaker. And uh, they've actually had a very interesting um, achievement if I can put it that way today, which I'll be talking to Kalein about. But without any further ado, let's get my guests on. And I will start with uh, Muzi and Kozi. Here we go. Hi, Muzi. Hi, Scott. How you going, buddy? I'm all right with you. Excellent, thank you. Excellent. I'll just get Kalein on and we can get the show on the road. Here we go. Okay. Hi, Kalein. How are you? Excellent, thank you. Excellent. Can you put your camera on? Uh, give me a few seconds to gather my wits, man. <laughs> there you go. That's it. All good. Now, you guys know each yeah. other, so I don't have to, to make any uh, introductions as such. You just want to say hi? Hi, Michael. Now, okay, before we get into this, I, I just want to let everybody know that uh, Colleen's YouTube channel has just gone ballistic. And... Uh, Colleen, you had a milestone today. You hit 8,000 subscribers. And I remember... Yeah, I think, you my, <laughs> I think you it was... Me. Yeah. I, I, I think it was back in about February, March, when we first um, uh, had a chat to you. And uh, back then, you only had a couple of hundred. So your your progression has been amazing. And I, I do see your vids, so your skid marks in, in uh, WhatsApp groups and all sorts of stuff. So you certainly make a difference out there. Well, Scott, the big thing is this, and it's very close to what your policy is. Somebody must tell the truth. Exactly, yeah. All right. And people are scared of the truth. Yeah. And oh, just, just for the record, so everybody knows that uh, when talking about the truth, when it becomes a bit controversial and subjects you can't talk on YouTube because of censorship, Colleen's going to be putting those videos up directly on Loving Life TV. Just, just a. Uh, heads up there. Now, let's get right into this, guys. We're talking about South Africa, and we're talking about topical issues related to South Africa. 
And Muzi, you, you actually proposed the question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the, the question to you first, and then I'm going to ask Colleen to, to put his perspective on. And uh, there are a few questions I've got that uh, I think we should also be discussing, so I'll throw those into the mix. Okay, so let's start off with the infamous Sasa army. Now, just a bit of background to that. Colleen is of the view that there is uh, basically an ANC strategy to create this army of young people who are going to create chaos in South Africa in the future. Muzi, what are your views on the Sasa army? Um, first, let me say that recently I have come to the conclusion that as a, as a young person who's tried his best to somewhat make a difference, share the truth and so on, I've sort of taken a backseat ride in, a, in an active attempt to try and make a difference because it was burning me out when in reality nothing ever changes. So uh, let me just say right now I might not be at my best game because I decided to take a backseat ride. Right. But when it comes to the Salsa Army, I did get that from Colneal. Um, and I, I honestly think he's right. And we see that this army already exists. We see what they've been doing. And that army is pretty much all those unemployed druggies that we saw at um, Malema's rally of Kill the Boar. A lot of the people there were just exactly that, the Salsa Army, who had nowhere to go, nothing to do, no hopes many of them drug addicts, and they were given a bath and a t-shirt to look clean as if they actually have a, a future. But that's not the case. And unfortunately, this Sasa army, it, I never thought that the NC could strategize this far, but whether it be their plan or not, these children exist in order to destroy because they don't know anything else to do. And many of them are not doing well in school for obvious reasons. Many of them are just born for the convenience of just receiving a, a Sasa grant. And no one's teaching them anything. And unfortunately, they are the ones who need to hear conversations like this. But they look at me and say, I'm an Oreo, an Uncle Tom, a sellout, uh, a privileged, clever black. They look at Coneal and say he's racist just because he's Afrikaans. And they would not listen to us. But yet, they're the ones who need to hear this the most. And it's so sad that their IQ levels, of course, are, are just very low, extremely low. And, um, you know, this is what happens when you're born into, when you're born in randomness. No one prepared for you to be born. No one, you know, tried to educate you correctly or even feed you nutritious food. A lot of people struggle uh, cognitively because of malnutrition and uh, their brains really don't operate very well, thus, you know, hindering their IQ levels. So this Sasa army is real. They are in play. They are the ones being used to sell an image that uh, they can destroy this country. But I am of the opinion right now that if they wanted to destroy the country immediately as they make it sound like they are, they would have by now. They understand that the golden goose is still required to keep this country flowing. So, I'm not really in fear of this Sasa army. They are just deployed strategically in specific places um, in order to sell that image of fear. That's that's my opinion of it. Right. Well, I, I just want to make an observation. I was listening to a video um, a few hours ago where uh, it's about Zimbabwe. And uh, this reporter asks this uh, Zimbabwean um, whether he goes out and steals to make you know to survive and he says no so the reporter said why not and this guy said quite quite innocently he said there's nothing left to steal i mean that's that's how bad things have got in zimbabwe now Colleen, over to you about the sasa army well scott i did i coined that phrase of the sasa generation and I started with skid marks about, I would say about four or five months ago, talking about it. Because to me, that is a very disturbing thing 
but it also gives you a damn clear indication of how evil and soulless this cabal is. This was planned in the 90s already. They knew it. And I mean, the fact of the matter is, and I've had many guys uh, taking me on about me calling them the Sasa generation. And in one of my skid marks, I explained what I mean when I say the Sasa generation. And I'm specifically talking about those kids that were born from that grant system and that are growing up primarily fatherless and secondarily many times motherless because the granny's got to look after them. And I'm, I'm a, and I've done two skid marks on it. I'm of, a, uh, I'm of the opinion that discipline is installed in children by the father. That is his role, to discipline the children. He teaches them discipline. The mothers, they do their part, but mothers, they've got this, you know, oh, my poor baby, and protect and protect and nurture and protect. Whereas a father, he tends to be more, I want to say, dissociated from that passion. He sees the kid do something wrong and he rivets him. Because he knows that conduct like that will cost him dearly in later life. So... The social generation are specifically then these children that are fatherless and many times motherless, ill-disciplined. And then here comes the kicker to show you how absolutely evil these fuckers are. There is no provision anywhere to educate these children. There's no education opportunities for them. And then further, there is absolutely nothing happening in the economy to prepare the workplace for these children when they get to the age that they must start getting productive. And the latest numbers that I've got, the children under the age of 19 up to the age of six, which is school going age, there's 17 million of them. 17 million. Let that number sink in. That is an astronomical number. How is the country going to cope with those people when they become of age so they start working? There's no job. So they're going to be unemployed and now if you go and look what the cabal has done in the middle east they killed 11 million people there they killed 500,000 iraqi children and they don't deny it that on albright said yeah it was a difficult decision but it was worth it They've killed thousands in Yemen. They are killing now, as we are talking, hundreds per day in the Ukraine. So these people have got absolutely no moral scruples about killing people. Now, my opinion is that the Republic of South Africa is going to collapse. That is the grand plan. That is what Cyril's, that is Cyril's mission, to destroy the Republic, balkanize South Africa. And in order to get to that balkanization process, the trigger is riots 
They need riots. Now, if you look what happened in Pakistan and what happens in Iran, it costs the CIA literally millions of dollars to mobilize people from Pakistan or people from Iran to do this riot thing. But, okay, here in South Africa, they've got their army in reserve. And to fire them up is a t-shirt in uh, Kentucky. And they go. And they destroy. In my one of my skid marks I did during the week about the taxi riots. I had a piece of a video in there of a colored guy that said that he, they were astounded that the destruction and the the things that were destroyed and the major mayhem was these young black children doing it. And what disturbed them the most is those black children were destroying schools and assets in the black communities. Now, you must ask yourself, why do they do it in the black communities? But the reality is they, they were easy and quick, just like that, to mobilize. I mean, to pack that stadium at FNB. Yeah. It is scary to think, uh, you know, that there were so many guys so quickly available to fill that stadium. And that should make you think back to that 17 million, that number of 17 million. Now, I spoke to the woman that works here in my home twice a week, uh, doing the laundry and a little bit of the housework. And we talked about the children. And she said to me that they, in the townships, are living in fear of their lives of these youngsters. It's because those youngsters is nobody can control them, and once they start on a rampage, they're unstoppable, and they're not afraid to kill. Yeah. So we have to pay special attention to the reality of that Sasa Brigade. It's a real thing, and you cannot. Uh, there's no way that you can justify it, that they were bred for a purpose. They are the ones that's going to start the big riots that is going to lead to the final collapse of the Republic. But you must just understand, the government cannot control it. And they're going to bring in peacekeepers. Uh, the United Nations. Yeah, and those peacekeepers are the ones that are going to mow these youngsters down by the thousands, if not by the millions. Because there is no way that South Africa, be it a republic, be it a federation of independent states, but the, uh, the end product cannot cope with 65 million people. The CSIR did a thing back in the 70s. A friend of mine was part of the team. And they came to the conclusion that South Africa can cope with 45 million people. Then there will be enough water for the people and for agriculture. We're sitting at 65 million. And there's about 25, 30, some people say 30 million immigrants here. But the immigrants is not a problem for the cabal. They ship them back to wherever they came from. That 20 million excess in our population. You must understand this cabal is not idiots. They, they want a country to be operational so that they can make money. And they know there's 20 million too much here. Yeah. And if you look at the fact that they, first of all, they didn't give them any education. So they spent nothing on their education. 
They spent nothing to provide jobs for them. So it is as if they have bred them to have an expiry date. This sounds extremely brutal if I say it like that. But it's like a guy that breeds uh, sheep for the meat market. He's got his stud that are doing the breeding. But that lamb's coming off there. They were bred for a purpose, and the purpose is to be slaughtered. Yeah. And that's it. So that guy is not going to, uh, those are the, the, that sheep, they run free on the felt, and they've been fed a little bit here and there, but they are very much left to their devices. You know, just... And when it's slaughter time, he collects them and slaughters yeah. them, and he doesn't get emotional about it. Now, Colleen... I, I, yeah. I just want to say that um, what you're saying is so on the money because the one world government see us as chattel. They see us as collateral damage. We are totally disposable. This whole thing about human rights is a load of bullshit. But I, I do want to move on to, to another topic which is related to this. And, and that is that um, when you look at the Sasa generation and, and you, you raise the point that they often don't have a father and often don't have a mother. And the old tribal way was Ubuntu, where the village, or, yeah, the little village looked after the children. It wasn't just the mother, the actual villages within the village. It was, it was a community thing. And, and that, that, yeah. that aspect of community life in the, in the villages of South Africa has completely broken down. So that, that cultural way has disappeared. And I've got a question now for, for you, Muzi. Um, do you think tribalism is the solution or do you think that it's irrelevant to what's happening in South Africa today? I am against tribalism as uh, I know where I come from. I know my tribe and my king, the king of the Swazis is a monster and a murderer. And so his children make videos laughing at all those who died fighting for democracy. Yet the same people in Swaziland who are fighting for democracy, as soon as they get that freedom, they want to fight against democracy, saying it's a Western concept. These people don't know what they want, number one. And number two, tribalism in the sense you just explained that back then in the villages, the idea of Ubuntu worked well. It worked well back then because the elements were against the people. They were not developed as the European where they could create a civilization that had convenience. Without convenience, they had to work with one another in order to survive. The climate didn't force them to work very hard so they could take it easy. But regardless, the elements forced them to gather the way they gathered and operate the way they operated. Unfortunately, tribalism of that standard brought into this day and age is still being practiced in the townships in which the community is everybody in the township, in which the, the, the elders and the ones who teach the children how to be is the streets, right? And for me, the only reason, well, it's not the only reason, one of the reasons I can assess all these things is because I was not allowed to go play in the streets. I was kept inside the house. I was taught that I need to read books and find ways to uh, entertain myself instead of relying on playing in the streets. So a lot of the children growing up under this Ubuntu tribalism thing, they are a victim of it because there was no idea of mom and dad is raising you in one house. It was everybody in the community will raise you and show you the way. And unfortunately, the negative side of the community, well, that was a part of life, right? Then the, the standards of how to actually be as an individual is cast aside. Where an example of this is uh, the Tosa tribe where I don't know when, but there was a king who, in Tosa tradition, they say all kings must be perfect physically. He must not be sick or have one foot or whatever. So one king was like that a long time ago. Then he went hunting, got his uh, finger bitten off by a leopard. And then from then they said, we love this king so much. So every child born from now on, we're going to cut off a little bit of their pinky. <clears throat> wow. That practice is, well, traditional, it's tribal. And there's still some Tosa people today walking around with a, with a cut pinky. 
right? They might not even know where that tradition comes from or why they lost their pinky. They just do it. Because there was no real standard, no book, no, no example that was written in stone or written on paper that this is how we will live, these people just try to adapt uh, to whatever circumstance they find themselves in. And their way of adapting is through an opportunistic way. How can I get as much as possible by working as least as possible? That's the norm, right? And then this takes away personal responsibility. Not only that, but it, education does not free black people from tribalism and their, well, cognitive impairment. Uh, this is because a lot of their cognitive impairment comes from trauma or witchcraft. I am a victim of both trauma and witchcraft, and witchcraft alone can traumatize you can cognitively impair you, literally making you retarded. So that means your IQ is diminished, right? And it can be permanent if somebody does not get involved at an early age that this child's development cognition has been stunned because of trauma. These things are not assessed, they are not brought up, and so they grow up ignorant and so on. You might find an educated black person who is still tribalistic. One that you mentioned before, Scott, a long time ago, a professor from the University of um, KZN, who joined a rally to go burn down a building, but he's yes. a professor. And you were shocked as to how can he just easily partake in this group thing? It's because he never cast aside his tribalism. He is butt naked without fit, fitting into a tribe. And so because I can stand as an individual, they hate me. I'm a, I'm a threat. So does the Swazi king, those sees the, the, the individual as a threat as well. Why? Because he doesn't want people living for themselves. He doesn't want people being independent. The ANC operates the same way. They don't want an independent people, black, white, or whatever. They want slaves. They want people as subjects of the state where they are the kings and queens forever eating you know, expensive stuff at the top while we eat cow dung like a lot of Swazi people do right now. And yet those exact same people still praise the Swazi king, even though he might have killed their grandson. They still do so. So I, this is why I'm against tribalism, because there are no real rules. There are no <clears> real <throat> rules and there are no examples. And the whole thing of, in, for me personally, my, I grew up in a home where mom and dad was in the house. But I was mostly taught by my mother a bit of morality. Other things I had to learn for myself. My dad didn't care. He didn't. He treated me like how his stepfather treated him, and he made sure that I know that this is how his stepfather treated him. And when I asked, but why? I'm not your stepson. He said, no, I just want you to, to understand what it was like. It made no sense. There is something wrong with uh, black people, unfortunately, and it's because of trauma. They don't know how to process trauma, and so when it just, it, it's never processed, well, it hinders their life. And it hinders their thinking, their processing of information, and they always come to the wrong conclusion. And then it makes it easier for them to just participate in group thought and forsake everything they learned in a textbook or university or whatever, just because everybody else is doing it. So tribalism for me, it does not work for black people. It is terrible. It is a terrible idea. It can work for the European, that the Dutch go to the Dutch, the Afrikaner to the Afrikaner, the Russian to the Russian. But for us, it doesn't work because me being slightly light-skinned, they can condemn me just for that. Sounding uh, this way, speaking this sort of English, they can condemn me just for that. There is tribalism within a singular tribe. You're too light-skinned, you're too tall, you're too weird or you're too whatever. It never ends. Why? Because there's no standard of, well, a bar. There's no bar. No one has actually set a bar. The bar has always been the king. And the king's word is law. And unfortunately, the king makes up things as he goes. And no one ever questions it. So it is a bad idea to say black people ought to look at their tribes. Their tribes have nothing to offer but this dysfunction. There are still those in the townships whose grandmothers lived through a lot of things who raised the grandchildren, but the grandchildren still kill that very same grandmother, bury her in the yard, and steal her salsa uh, grant card. So it's like, what did what happened, grandma? Uh, you were teaching, you were raising these children, but they still killed you. 
if not raped you. So how is it that this 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 is the solution? It, it's not the solution. And something I didn't do in our last conversation is that I never came to this conversation uh, in a spiritual um, uh, perspective. But today I am. And I'm going to say, yeah, a lot of the problems we're experiencing today are spiritual, particularly the Negro. His problem is belief. What they believe is what is really messing them up. What they believe and high, hold so um, important, well, is the honoring of the dead. And if you honor the dead, you dishonor the living. And this is why, you know, this, these things keep happening. And so telling them to go back to their tribe is a bad idea. If I were to take that advice, well, my grandmother was a witch, my great-grandmother was a legendary witch, I suppose I'd have to go through the rituals that they tried to initiate me in, which I still have the scars of it to prove, um, because it's part of my tribe. It's how people do things amongst my tribe. So it's not good advice for black people, I'd yeah. say. Well, look, I, I just want to speak to the Swazi king, because when I was a young man, I was about 17, 18, I actually um, went up to Swaziland to, to attend... I think it's called the rain dance, where he, the Swazi king marries a whole bunch of women at one time. And he does this every year. I mean, it, it's, it's an extraordinary thing. And the wealth of that family and the poverty of everybody else is, is quite extraordinary. Now, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Mizzy. Uh, well, people praise that. And I want to say the reason he takes wives every year is because many of his wives commit suicide every year. Oh, okay. They commit suicide because of the rituals that he needs to perform to stay in power. Some might say, oh, the rituals is nonsense and whatnot. Whether it's nonsense or not, the problem is they believe it, and so they do it. Yeah. The Swazi king every year must uh, sleep with a bull, a cow, have sex with an animal. What? And, well, this is very vulgar, but, okay, I don't have to say that. But after doing that, he must then deposit all that spiritual voodoo upon selected wives and those wives don't live very long after experiencing that uh ritual after he's done with the book wow. that's what they're there for yeah and people know this but they just say well he's the king <laughs> he's the king now okay i'm gonna go back to Colleen. Colleen, tribalism what are your perspective on that look i agree with him when he says that tribalism among the Europeans is different than tribalism among the blacks. That I agree with. But then I must also add, as a young boy, I grew up among black people and uh, I learned a lot from black people, from the, I mean, I am Mariki, she had to look after the house on the farm, but her husband, out of Fred, he looked after the children. And there were about, if I remember correctly, there were about nine young blacks and me and ten children. And ten children is a handful. And he kept us in line. I learned a lot from him, I learned a lot from his wife. And then in my late in my teenagers years, I spent in Zululand, where I got to know the Zulu tradition and the Zulu people and and what he says about the Swazi, what the Swazi king do and what happened in his tribe, I can understand that because there are some of these tribes that are absolutely fucking from the Stone Age, man. And you can do nothing about it. But I don't agree that you must generalize that because the tribal things that I experienced in Zululand was totally different from what he's talking. Can I say and, why? Yeah? Yeah, go ahead, okay. Mizzy. The reason why is because I've said this before, some might believe it, some might not believe it. Because the ones in control of the country back then, there was a unspoken, unwritten standard of life, 
right? Apartheid provided a standard of life that was very, very evident. And I suppose people forget, and I, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, white people forget that a black person is not really, doesn't act the same when he's with you versus when he's at home. He doesn't. They never do. And so what you experienced was back then when there was a standard and when there was order, when there was a knowing amongst the people that you do bad, you will be punished for it. Now, when they are in control, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because now, well, they're in control, so whatever, right? So that's, that's the main difference as to like why you experience it differently versus now, because those who, whom you met, whom taught some of the children you grew up with, the black children you grew up with, some of those black children you grew up with who now have children, those children are messed in the head, right? Those same standards of back then that apartheid provided, I suppose, um, unfortunately, they didn't keep it because the propaganda was abandoned. All this, the, even the good standards that uh, the Afrikaner brought in the country abandoned all those things. It is not of your tribe. It is not you. Who you are is something different. And they never said what that is. And what we see now is that I suppose you're just a barbarian. Because there are no standards right now. Okay. Now, Colin, back to you. Okay, Musi, tell me. South Africa. The primary tribes in South Africa. There's three. Name them for me. Zulu, the Kosa, and... Well, I don't want to say the Ndebele. I'm not sure about the third. Uh... That's a lot of people, I think. The primary tribes of Southern Africa is the Khoisan, the Zulu, and the Buddha. That's oh. the primary tribes of South Africa. And okay. the problem that is today brewing in the country with all this racism that has been blown out of proportion by Malema and these drones and the ANC and everybody, all the black politicians and so, the racism thing that they're driving, they're missing one major thing. And a lot of white people also miss it. The real problem the real fight is going to be between the black tribes. That is where the violence is going to be. That is where the massive killings are going to be. Because there's a portion in the Zulu nation, and I'm going to call them the right wing. And they are associated and affiliated to Inkata, which is extremely tribal. And there's a big portion of those Zulus that has got a serious problem with the northern tribes. And that's a problem that, came, that comes back from Shaka. And the fact of the matter is that if you look at what is happening in the ANC specifically, if you look at the ANC leadership, Take note, there's not a single one person there that you can actually tie to a tribe. They're this cosmopolitans, tribeless. And that is all part of the Kalergi plan that was published already back in 1924 to dis disassociate people from their culture. That is a massive, massive drive. There was one leader in the ANC that was a tribalist. And incidentally, he was also the president that did the most, that did a lot of things that benefited the people and not the cabal. And that was Jacob Zuma. And that is why he had to go. He had to go. There is documentation that I've seen that was in 
the pre-90s negotiations already. And one of the things in that document was a Zulu or a Boer must never get in charge of the country. And if you see the speed with which the, and the violence and the money and the stunts they pulled to get rid of Zuma, it is hair-raising. And there's so many accusations against him. Yeah, he's not squeaky clean. I mean, don't get it wrong. But if you look at what he did, compared to what Mandela did and what uh, Becky did and what Ramaphosa is doing, uh, Zuma is, uh, I mean, he's a Sunday school teacher, actually. The fact of the matter is that there's a lot of the black people, especially here in the cities and northern areas, that has got no recollection of how violent Zululand was during the 70s and the 80s. And a lot of that was. was I don't want to call it tribal violence because it wasn't really tribal violence. It was more clan violence. Because every tribe has got its different clans. And there was a lot of clan violence. And that Zulus, now of the tribes in South Africa, there's only two tribes that has got a real warrior history. And that is the Buddha and the Zulus. And incidentally, it was the Buru and the Zulus were also the only tribes that could ever that beat the English. So those two tribes has got this background. And in the Zulu tribe, there's a lot of animosity because they feel that the Zulus has been sidelined by the ANC. And after I did a skid mark on that, and after I did the skid mark, I got a message from a guy, and he said to me, he's a colored guy, and he said to me, I, you know what, I listened to your thing here, and I want to tell you, I'm in, I'm in the army, Sandef. In Sandef, a Zulu or a Pedi, their contracts are not renewed. When they get to the end of their contract, they must go. They don't renew their contract. Zulus and Pedis don't get promotion. Now, <laughs> I don't think that's a very clever plan. This is, that's a case of the cleverness is broken. But So there is this undercurrent in the country that is overshadowed and overwhelmed by the black on white racism narrative that is spread by the media and by the cabal and by all the cabal agents and so forth. But I've said it many times to my children when they talk about these things, and I mean, the, younger, the youngest one was extremely military. And I said to him, okay, you have been to town today. At which shop did you walk in and the cashier refused to serve you? On which sidewalk were you when you were mugged? Where at what shop did they say you cannot enter because you're white? At what place that you've been in today did they tell you they're going to kill you? And he said, no, nothing. And I said, okay, but that's it. I mean, I go to town, I stop at the fuel pumps, I put fuel in, me and the guy there start, we, we talk, we talk about the children and we talk about the, everything. And we laugh at things and we bitch about things and we swear at the politicians. And at no stage does he want to kill me or I want to kill him. But if you listen to Malema, that is what is the real thing. Everybody wants to kill everybody. But I've got news for them. When the killing starts, 
The white people, all, all they need to do is just stay out of the crossfire. Just stay out of the crossfire. Because there is so much, in subtle, subtle, some aspects, so much hatred between black tribes that you, you cannot imagine it. And as I said last night to a guy when we were in a debate, and I said to him, what a lot of people, especially from outside of South Africa, do not understand and cannot even begin to imagine is how violent these blacks really are. They don't understand that. They, you know, like their references, educated life in a city in Europe or somewhere. Boy, that's a total different story. You come to a township in South Africa and you see what they do to each other there. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. look at what they do to each other. So I can understand your uh, negative feelings about tribalism, but what you cannot take away is the reality of tribalism. And tribalism is that low point where you sink in when you go to your roots. That is where it is. And unfortunately, I think that a lot of these cosmopolitan blacks, I'm going to call them cosmopolitan blacks because that's what they are, they have lost touch with that. And they do not understand what will happen if tomorrow morning the Jobo people open their eyes and there's 150 buses from KwaZulu rolling into Jobo packed with impis. Who the hell is going to stop them? In the, 90s, in the 90s, the white police force and the white army stopped them. But who's going to stop them tomorrow morning? Who? Yeah. Now, I just, I just oh, want to pick up on what you were saying okay. there, uh, Colleen. And this is uh, regarding Julius Malema and his uh, chant, kill the boor, kill the farmer, which is clearly aimed at creating racist tension in South Africa. And you raise a really interesting point, which I totally agree with, and that is that when anarchy does happen in South Africa, um, I, I think it's going to be between warring black cultures and black groups. Um, I'm going to put this question to Muzi. Muzi, what are your thoughts on first what Malema is trying to achieve by saying or singing things like that? And, and what do you think will happen when South Africa becomes a complete basket case? Okay, uh, with the Malema thing, I honestly think it's it's just a, a fear tactic. And because as uh, Colleen said, when a white person goes to pick and pay, there isn't a black person who says, I'm not going to help you. Uh, get out of here or whatever. Uh, you go to the petrol station. Uh, there's no there's no fighting. You know, the, what Malema says on TV versus what happens in reality, there's none of that. But does this mean that there is no hatred in a lot of black people for white people? Um, there is that hatred because I see it. I speak from experience because I live amongst them, right? People whom I never thought would dare say they have a hatred for white people, such as my little cousin who's 23. I asked him, why? Why do you hate them? Oh, I don't know, I just do. My niece, a, a year younger than me, she said, as soon as all white people leave, we will have jobs. And I said, <laughs> we have a degree in political science. How can you come to such a conclusion? And she did not use reason at all. It was a hatred that I don't know where it actually comes from, especially amongst the young. I don't know. And then amongst the elderly, like uh, my um, aunties and uncles, they have it too. And now they are, they are all double-minded in their doctrine in which there's all smiles and giggles. 
Some speak Afrikaans and everything is going well in the public. But at home, there is that hatred. There is that hatred. And Malema knows it. And he knows that he, he knows how to bring it out and get them all in this euphoric uh, experience of hatred. But Malema knows and they know that they can't necessarily go out there and kill all the white people. They are the golden goose. They don't want to lose the standard of living that um, Europeans have brought because it will be a very big inconvenience. So the hatred is there, but none of them actually have the actual bravery to actually go out there and say, I'm just going to kill you just because you're white. The, mur the murders we see in the farms, yes, a lot of the farmers, the good farmers, the best of farmers is the Afrikaner. And we see a lot of uh, savages killing them. But this is, a, this, is an, this is a thing of George Soros or the triple X trying to destabilize the food security here, right? So that we know when the peacekeepers come, they will have food baskets and they're going to require you to either take something in your arm or follow their new rules and regulations in order to get the food basket, right? At the end of the day, there's still too many savages right now. And so if you destabilize the food security by destroying the farmers, well, there's going to be less people. There's going to be less people. So that works in Triple X's favor because that's their overall goal, decrease the population everywhere. And what is my, what was the second question again? What was the second question? Yeah, you said, what do I think about the Malema thing? And then second, oh, what what's actually going to happen? Yeah, with, with the anarchy, yes. Into mm. A basket case. I've also said that the first thing that will happen when everything collapse, they will destroy each other. Like, let's look at Soweto. A lot of people won't have cars to drive to Santa. So they're going to go into their neighbor's house or their neighbor's business, right? We saw in 2021, when all that madness happened because of Zuma, they were destroying places that they lived at, went to malls that they shop at because it was in, within reach, right? It was not targeted because the white people are there or so-and-so is there. It was because it's, it, it's within reach. So when everything falls apart, they are going to destroy themselves first, obviously. They have no loyalty amongst each other, even within the tribes. Heck, if my own grandmother can try to kill me with uh, witchcraft, that's saying something, right? So they are going to try, they're not going to try, they are going to kill each other, they are going to eat each other, eat each other and there is going to be a small number who will be able to mobilize and try to come to the cities and pillage. But by then, it'll be too late because those who are organized, as we saw in Phoenix, uh, in Durban in 2021, they easily repelled them because a lot of them don't have a plan. They're just barbarians. Barbarians just throw sticks and go in there with brute force and depend on numbers. No planning, no strategy. They're predictable, all of them. And all you have to do is shoot one and then they'll run. So at the end of the day, I don't, I don't even fear uh, this great collapse because I think it's exaggerated. Honestly, I do because these people are predictable. They're extremely predictable. And how can you fear a savage <laughs> whom you know what he'll steal, what he's looking for, and he doesn't really have a means of escape, right? He doesn't have a means of escape. Some might try to walk and try to go steal your TV if you live in Santa, but that makes no sense. He'll be too tired to fight you for that TV when he comes into your house. It would be easy to take him down, you know? I honestly see this imminent collapse and, and uh, what the savages could do as, I don't want to say as doom pill or fear porn or whatever, because we see it, we see a glimpse of it. But I think it is exaggerated. Uh, I used to see or feel the same way that it could be this chaotic, it could be that and that. But after a proper assessment, I just don't see a reason to be afraid of it. But if I'm wrong and it does happen, it's not like there's anything we can do about it. 
and that's my new model now. Well, there's nothing I can do. I have tried to do something. And above all else, those who are actually working, because now that I'm working once again, but not working remotely, this has been the greatest um, opener for me because when I worked before, it was remotely working here at home. But now that I've got this job and I actually have to go to work, I see that the working class don't have time at all to think about the things we're talking about. They don't. The ones who own small businesses, they're too busy trying to make a profit. They are endlessly stressed. They don't receive the same money they received last month, and they always have to win over their client. They don't think about any of this. So we who are talking about this are either us who are the concerned citizen who was unemployed, or the retired elder who knows what a standard uh, community or civilization ought to be. But those in the middle who are working or ignorant, they're either alcoholics or they're trying to make ends meet. That's not an excuse because you need to understand where you live, but unfortunately, that's just how it is. When you try to open their eyes to this reality, to this possibility, They'll say, I've heard that a thousand times, it's been 50 years, or it's been 10 years, or whatever, nothing has still happened. And to some extent, I've now realized that, you know what, despite the failing infrastructure and stuff, the mere fact that I can still get whatever I want and receive it in less than a month or a month, whatever an American has, I can get it too, and I'm not even like a, a rich person. It means, this. how can this country be completely uh, useless? Because I still have the possibility to access anything I want. I can order a book across the ocean, it comes within a month, so on and so on. I can go to Burger King or McDonald's and everything's working, yada, yada, yada. So a lot of people look at that and say, but everything is still fine. Yes, it's more expensive. Yes, there's more crime, but everything is still operating. And this is the private sector, of course. How is it still standing? Well, it must be the triple X funding everything. Yeah. And that's another thing is that how is it that despite seeing this imminent collapse, why are they continuing to build? There are 4G towers, 5G towers going up around my neighborhood. A month ago, they were not there. Uh, they're building a new Burger King and a McDonald's down the road. These transnational corporations, big businesses are still thriving. It's yeah. as if they're exempt from all the electricity bills that uh, the small businesses have to pay, right? So whatever, whatever they're exempt from and however they receive their stock, because you never hear of savages raiding a, a, a KFC truck delivering chicken. It never happens. It's never happened, right? So how is it that they're still standing? And the worker looks at this and says, you're, you're exaggerating. And I understand his mindset now. And the young person who's completely demoralized and has no future despite his degree or whatever, he says, I don't care, I just want to smoke. Uh, my life is over, leave me alone. So I do think that the, the, the savagery and the collapse is a bit exaggerated. When it happens, it will not be how we've been told it will be as this gigantic um, war zone, but People should take comfort in the savages are going to first kill each other. And whoever survives there is going to come to, is going to try to come to your house. But they'll be too tired and you'll see them coming. So what is there to fear, really? Yeah. You know, that's how I see it. Yeah. I, I just want to welcome, we've got 125 people watching on YouTube and over 500 watching on our other platform, which is Loving Live TV. So... Good to see you all here. Please remember to register on LovingLifeTV.com. And um, please, if you're on YouTube, subscribe to this uh, channel where we have live streams most nights. And uh, please like this video. Now, um, over to you, Kalen. Just the same question. Um, your response to Malema's shoot the boar and uh, the anarchy should... Is it going to be black on black violence, or what? What is your view as to what's going to happen when the shit hits the fan in South Africa? I, I am totally 
convinced that the mass violence is going to be black on black. That is going to be the most of the violence. The, yes, there will be whites getting killed, but that will be, I would almost say, collateral damage. The drive between the blacks, the way that the way that they give, uh, the way that they bent their anger makes it a very unpredictable type of thing because they are spontaneously violent. They'll burn a black shop down just as fast as they'll burn a white shop down. They'll kill a white, they'll kill a black uh, person on the sidewalk just as fast as they're going to kill a white person on the sidewalk. So to them, it is the violence itself is what fuels them. And they have to vent that violence. And uh, if they have to travel 450 kilometers to get to my place, they're not going to do it. There's a lot of townships between me and them where they're going to do it. And they know that the townships, the people in the townships, are more vulnerable than the whites living in a gated community or something. Because most of the white people, and I'm not, I'm not going to say white people, most of the Buddha is fairly competent to defend themselves. And they know it. They, they, they're not stupid. They know that. So, uh, I, but all I want to say is, I am extremely happy that I don't live in a city. The people in the cities are going to be, they're going to be in for a rough ride. And uh, something that Musi has said that, oh, they're going to, you know, by the time they get to Santon, they're going to be tired. What you must not lose focus on is that Joburg in totality is surrounded by squatters, millions of them. Millions, literally millions. And some of those squatter settlements are less than two street blocks away from business centers. From So they, they, they're not that far away. They're there. And then there is another... Uh, the thing is this, as I said, they were absolutely soulless and evil in breeding the Sasa Brigade. Why do you think they allowed all the immigrants in? And they put them into squatter camps around the cities. Those are the people that are going to make those cities ungovernable. Because you must understand that the authorities are going to be pushed to a point where they have no option but to call for outside help. And that is exactly what the cabal wants. Because then the UN troops will stream in. But now in South Africa, we're in a peculiar situation here. Uh, the majority of the people in South Africa is pro-BRICS, by definition pro-Russia. The only real short-term value, and I didn't want to say short-term, it's actually long-term, but the, the biggest asset of Southern Africa, South Africa specifically, is the Cape Sea route, because it is vital for BRICS to have that sea route open, because that is their gateway to America, South America, which is part of BRICS, North America, which is a consumer, and Europe, which is a consumer, 
And people say, yeah, but what about the Suez Canal? They, the Chinese has clearly showed us one container ship sideways in the Suez Canal and it's done. And now you've got this added uh, piece of spice in the pot. Egypt has applied to join BRICS. And Egypt is in control of the Suez Canal. So the sea route is going to be is, is vital. And that's actually what the Americans want. That's all they want. That's why I say the, uh, the real, uh, the, I am of the opinion that South Africa is going to be balkanized. But, and they only want the Cape. That's all they want. Now, if uh, there was a lot of talk about Maidan in South Africa and Mama Maidan was here and all of that. The problem with a proper Maidan in South Africa is if they do a regime change, who will be the new regime? Because they have to have an alternative. Otherwise, they can't drive that plan. They cannot go for the EFF. Because the EFF is more pro-Russia and more pro-BRICS than the ANC. And absolutely outspokenly so. And then the Cape. That's what they want. Now, they can't bring the DA in because the DA has got a white leader. And it's not going to fly in the rest of the world if they topple a black president and put a white president in his position, that will be, that's out. That's totally out. So what's the third, op the third th option? Balkanize the country, grab the Cape, and that's it. And unfortunately, China and Russia is not going to sit on the sideline and watch them grab the Cape. Yeah. There were yeah. a lot of talks about this joint naval exercise between South Africa, China, and Russia. It's total bullshit story that the Chinese and the Russians were here on a scouting mission. They wanted to check and see where their ships can get in and how they can get in and all of that. That's what that. That is why they were here. No other reason. Right. So yeah. that is where I think. If push comes to shove, now the BRICS, the BRICS thing, has thrown a spanner into the works of the timeline. BRICS, as such, is a major problem for the West, major. And uh, this conference that is now going to happen within the next few days, that is when BRICS will expand. And the West, I thought, uh, look, it's, there's still a few days left, but I thought we're going to see more of a lot of protests and violence to prevent the BRICS meeting to actually happen. But who knows? Yeah. Now, look, we'll talk, uh, uh, we'll talk about BRICS very uh, shortly, uh, but I just want to keep this theme going regarding what's happening in South Africa. And uh, I know for Muzi, um, there's a very important aspect, and, and that is something that is not talked about as much as it should be, and that is witchcraft in the uh, villages, and it's, it's, it's like part of the culture, and it's a very destructive force. Muzi, would you like to just address this issue and how witchcraft is causing the dysfunction of blacks in South Africa? Yeah, honestly... Uh, it's not spoken about at all. While we always focus on the political, geopolitical problems, um, because it sells newspapers and it can make you feel quite intelligent and all these things, ultimately the root cause of the dysfunction amongst the majority of these people is their enjoyment and participation of witchcraft. Now, I once mentioned a bit of this to Colain, and he said his tribe managed to burn all the witches hundreds of years ago. And I said, exactly. It's why you are functioning very well. Here, all black tribes, they never burnt their witches. 
they're still here. They're still operating. They're celebrities. Their doctrines of do this, do that ritual, yada, 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 is still very popular. And the young people still participate in it. And I said, part of the side effects of this witchcraft participation and whatnot is that it does impair the mind. It impairs the mind. If I don't want to talk about the supernatural stuff, I'll talk about it in the real world, the real world effects, which is cognitive impairment, right? This is why all these people are the way they are. And so this is why I say you can't necessarily educate these people and give them a book and teach them about the importance of bricks or this or that. They won't get it because where they live, there's all this evil and lawlessness happening around them with nobody calling it out. The pastors have failed because they themselves are participants of this uh, ancestor worship and all the, these death cults and, and um, rituals. They, they participate in it. No one has stood up and said, hey, uh, we need to stop this. This is not working for us at all, right? There have been numerous reports late last year about uh, children being abducted, uh, abducted and their private parts being cut for ritual purposes. It still happens now. The township here in Nelspray called Binari, they recently caught a guy last year who was doing that exact same thing and then he was set free from prison. Set free to go roam and abduct, uh, abduct other children to perform the same rituals. Right to sell those parts to witch doctors. Witch doctors are too well respected here. They're too well respected amongst uh, black people. You come as an intellectual with a book, they don't care about your book. Your book is not a symbol of power and control. Voodoo is a symbol of power and control. And so without this fundamental understanding, it does not matter what you say. It doesn't matter what evidence you have to show about Putin or this or that, or it is Cyril who made the water have cholera. They do not care because they cannot care because they are cognitively impaired. They cannot process any information coming in and uh, come to the proper conclusion. They can't do it. And so this is why they do poorly in schools, right? But of course they decrease the, the pass rate on purpose. I try to be a part of a mental health awareness campaign here. I go to the website, it's called the Nelspray Mental Health uh, Association, something like that. And I see they're running a campaign about it's okay to be intellectually disabled. They are pushing this narrative to the young black children whom they say they're trying to help, but they are telling them, no, you're intellectually disabled. It's okay if you struggle with abstract thoughts. It's okay if you cannot conjure up any any helpful information or anything that can actually build anything it means you are intellectually disabled it's not your fault so there's no responsibility there's no one calling any of these things out and i being somewhat i suppose the only one doing so well i'm not taken seriously by them or anyone else because once again once again no amount of textbooks education can change a cognitively impaired person who still participates in their witchcraft. They are too loyal to their old ways. Their old ways that never helped them. They still pray to Mandela's bones. I don't know if you guys saw that article where the ANC in 2021 said they are going to go to Mandela's grave to ask for wisdom on how to run the country. This, this is complete madness, right? But it's real and they believe it and they practice it. Jacob Zuma, when the, the whole nonsense was happening in 2021, his little group were having rituals, well, not necessarily rituals, but they had witch doctors spraying water on these Zulu warriors so that they'll be bulletproof, so they can run through bullets to save Zuma. But they were not running towards uh, Zuma's prison where he was being held, they were running towards pick and pay. There were no bullets coming their way, right? So cognitive dissonance, they suffer from that too because of all these things. And no leader, no African leader will ever say this is wrong because they know they will lose the favor of the majority. 
That's why there's always nonsense about the ancestors, this and this. Whichever young leader is trying to be in power or the, the, the EFF or the ANC themselves. So unfortunately, if we actually are trying to help, help ourselves by helping them, if we're just giving them a textbook, we're not helping anybody. We have to be able to say, this is the root problem. Because you practice these things that lead to your cognitive impairment, this is why you participate in re retardation. All you know is impulse. You have no self-control, right? You just want to operate on impulse, either uh, have a thousand children without preparing for it, or just fight your neighbor because he has better shoes than you. It's just absurd. So I'd say if we really want to help, then we have to address these things also. Because I don't know any other Christian leader in the country doing this. They're all doing things in vain, hoping that, oh, they just listen to them. But has evidence, is there any evidence that they have been listening? No, none whatsoever. So it's a, it's a gigantic problem. And without, being, without that being addressed, Unfortunately, we're just talking at the camera at this point because they are the majority, sadly. Oh, you there, Scott? Kalein, what, sorry, Kalein, what is your view on witchcraft and the um, uh, impact on the villages? Look. I am not going to even try and venture into that realm. I know too little about it. I, I hear here and there, you know, I pick it up and I have encountered stuff like that with some of my workers and so. But I, I know that it is a real thing to them. A lot of white people to make jokes about the tokoloshi, to them that's a real thing. And I've said many times, uh, whatever you do, don't make jokes about it. Because you don't understand enough of it, and by you making a joke of it, you're actually worsening the situation. Just listen and let it go, because you cannot change it. Uh, something that I know very well is the grip that the Sangomas have on the people. Yeah. It is a death grip. And, I mean, I had a situation here, a very loyal worker of mine, a guy that, I mean, I spent thousands of hours in his training and everything. And then he got AIDS. And my wife, there's a doctor in town that had an American sponsor. And my wife took him there because she knew the doctor. And the doctor got him onto that HIV program. And then she sees that this oak is still going backwards. And she asked him, are you drinking the pills? And he said, no. She said, why not? He said, no, no, no. Uh, his wife went to the Sangoma and she got some stuff that he must drink and he's drinking that. And five months later, he was dead. Jeez. So uh, the day I've got it, potent grip on them, that I can understand. And but this ties into what I said previously, that when the shit hits the fan, they're going to they're going to wipe each other out because they they don't think. They don't have a plan. I was in a debate one night with the guys and they were extremely militant and I said to them, you must never forget something. And that is that the white warrior is a fearsome thing and is a violent thing. And the reason I'm saying it to you is the white group 
is less than 8% of the world population. But the whites, they conquer and rule basically the whole world. And they didn't get it by dishing out lollipops. They fought hell of a wars and killed millions of people to achieve that. So don't get that out. But the reality is that the black people in South Africa, there is such a large percentage of them that is really, really mentally barely functional. Yeah. They don't understand anything. You can explain to him what you like. It doesn't go through. He doesn't have the ability to absorb whatever you tell him. And I can understand Musi's frustration because he's a bright young guy and then he's surrounded by idiots. And that must be that must be a hell of a lonely place to be. <laughs> yeah. but, but that's a fact. I mean, look, there's jokes about the IQ and so forth. But the fact of the, is that the average IQ was picked in South Africa at 67. And you know, 67, there's many Western countries where with an IQ of 67, you will be declared mentally retarded. Yeah. Okay. Now, look, guys, I'm going to change the... Um... Uh, direction a bit of this discussion. I mean, it's been fascinating. We've got close to 150 people watching just on YouTube and well over 500 on Loving Life TV. And guys, please register on lovinglifetv.com. Um, it's not just videos. We've got a huge forum with free downloadable PDFs covering everything from food, um, recipes, vitamins you name it it's all there it's an amazing amazing resource so please go and have a look at lovinglifetv.com um now where i'm going to move now guys is to bricks and and this is very topical because um on the 22nd to the 24th of august um we have the bricks meeting in cape town and one of the uh, uh, hang on where's this cape town story coming from Hang on, let me, you, can, you can respond in a second, okay? <laughs> let me finish my, my discourse here. Um, what, one of the things that is, is going to be huge in the near future, and that is the two different directions that the West or the, the G7 countries and the BRICS countries are taking. The G7 countries, which is basically the USA, Australia, Canada, um, the UK, etc., they're sticking with a centralized bank digital currency which will be still floated like fiat money. Whereas the BRICS countries are looking at a gold backed currency. And um, the Durban Accords, as they're going to call it, will be announced on the 22nd of August, which is the launch of a new international currency backed by commodities. And by that, I mean gold. And of course, China and Russia are the number one and number two in gold mining today. So they've got a huge uh, resource of gold compared to countries like the USA. And from my reasoning, it makes a lot more sense to use a currency that is backed by something tangible like gold than the G7 or the central bank digital currency, which will actually be programmable so they can watch what you're doing. Use something like that, which is backed by debt. Now, Colleen, correct me if I'm wrong about uh, BRICS and where they're meeting, but then I just want you to get on to um, this question about the two different types of currency. You know, the central bank digital currency being proposed by the G7, backed by fiat or debt, and then the one that's backed by gold, which has been proposed by the BRICS countries. And let's remember there are about 20 countries or even more from around the world who want to join BRICS and uh, their, 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 their uh, position. Over to you, Colleen. 
All right. I think what we the first thing that we must understand when we talk about the BRICS currency is that that's not going to be a currency that you're going to use to buy a burger at Burger King or Kentucky or something like that. That BRICS currency is primarily for trading purpose purposes between the BRICS countries. In other words, uh, Russia will sell its oil or gas at X BRICS and uh, South Africa will buy that at X BRICS and send them the BRICS. But when that BRICS land into Russia, it will be immediately converted back to rubles. So the people in Russia will be operating with the rubles. If we sell fruit for X BRICS, the country that buys it is going to pay in that BRICS currency and the Reserve Bank will immediately switch it over to the local currency. That is, that is the role and the planned role of that currency. And the reason why China and Russia initially started the thing of saying that that currency must be backed by a basket of commodities. So they, they are looking at a situation that it will be backed by gold and maybe oil, most probably oil. And there's a very strong possibility that it's going to be backed by grain. In that basket of commodities will be right. grain and oil. And, and that is to give that currency stability. So that it doesn't, when the, currently what happens, when the Fed in America push the button and the printers go, and they print another trillion dollars, the value of your dollar that you've got in your pocket is immediately affected. Because there's now a trillion more. And that is what they want to get away from. And that BRICS currency is seen as a future global reserve currency. And none of the countries, neither Russia nor China, wants their currencies to be global reserve currencies. They don't want that because to them, it doesn't suit their economies. And it will mean that a lot of other countries all of a sudden is going to have a hell of an effect on their fiscal health. So none of these countries actually wants to replace the dollar as a reserve currency. That's why they're creating this BRICS currency. That BRICS currency is going to become the reserve currency. Because what will happen eventually when a BRICS country sells to America, they're going to insist that the Americans pay in BRICS. So that, that, that is the long-term thing. And then there are people that think that the BRICS currency is immediately going to collapse the dollar. That's not going to happen for two simple reasons. Actually, one simple reason. The trade between China and America is huge. I don't think, you know, we can try and imagine the size of the trade between China and, and America. And those two countries, of course, America will want dollars for their stuff. And China wants one for their stuff. So, just by China trading with America will prevent the dollar from burning and turning into ashes. But it's going to affect the value of the dollar tremendously. And the way, so the BRICS currency is seen as becoming the trade currency between the countries. But that is going to take time to get into place. There's a hell of a lot of mechanisms that's going to be 
put into place and so forth. So they can talk a lot about the BRIC currency, but implementing it is going to be a different story. Because at this point in time, the thing that is actually happening, and that is what is busy emancipating the, let's call it, the global south, from the grip, the death grip of the dollar, is the fact that the global south is trading like hell in their own currencies. And it is beginning, and they're promoting it. I just saw an article, I didn't read it properly, that uh, the BRICS Bank has issued bonds in South African rand bonds today. Previously, it was only uh, Chinese won bonds that were sold. And now, today, they started selling rand bonds. So... That is a type of thing, and I don't. And I think that the main brains behind BRICS are not so focused on trashing the dollar, than they are focused on making it easier for all these countries that has been sanctioned to move and gone for so long to trade freely in their own currencies. Because you've already got a problem with Russia and India in the trading of uh, on own currencies. The Russians say, no, 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 no. We've got enough rupees. We can't spend your rupees anywhere else. We've got to spend it in India. And you don't have all the stuff that we want. We have got a lot of stuff that we want from other countries that don't want your rupees. So you either pay us in rubles or you pay us in yuan. So there's already you can already see and it's only a few months, something like uh, let's say about nine months that this trading in own currencies has taken off. And then there was a lot of people that this week made a hell of a story about the fact that the the ruble was losing value against the dollar. Now what they don't understand is that the Russian Central Bank has stopped supporting the ruble about three, four months ago because at that stage the ruble was here around about 65 ruble to a dollar. And it was becoming difficult for the Russian exporters because that strong ruble made their offerings on the market too expensive. And I've given an example to someone yesterday, uh, if you take in consideration that, say, a thing cost 600 rubles, you want to buy it, and you've got dollars, it means you need $10. A uh, hundred. Yeah, $10 to get 600 rubles, <clears throat> but when the ruble goes to nine to 95, you only need about seven, you know, seven and a half dollars to buy. Yeah. So it becomes cheaper for you to buy. And we see it here in South Africa. The rand goes, I mean, it's sitting now at 19 rand to the dollar. And the people that are struggling are the importers. They've got a major problem, but the guys that are producing locally, they're over the moon because they get a more of a lot of rents for their products because mm. they sell the product in dollars. They want $100, they get $100. And the moment that $100 hit the reserve bank, bam, they convert it to, to rents and they, he gets a bag full of rents. So that is it. <coughs> so yeah. to recap on what you asked about the currency is that people must not get overly romantically involved in the actual meaning of that currency. That currency is going to be for trading purposes. And the reason why they are tying that currency to commodities is to ensure stability of that currency. Because you cannot you know, as I said, you can, they can just, in the Fed, start printing dollars and all of a sudden your dollar you've got in your pocket is worth less. Now, for if that thing is 
backed by gold and by oil and by grain. Either somebody must start pumping oil like hell, and that means there's going to be oil, physical oil on the market, or they must start digging out gold like hell, and that's going to mean there's physical gold yeah. somewhere. And that will stabilize the thing, and it makes 100% sense, because uh, the, the guys that are talking outside of the mainstream narrative, they are all in agreement. That is that the dollar is going to turn to rubbish, ashes. But they last year in February, I was in a debate, and the one guy, the one guy started talking about it. Then the two other guys agreed with him, and they said that it will take ten to eighteen years to get rid of the role of the dollar, and then Ukraine war happened. And the sanctions on the Russia. And all of a sudden, the Russians had to trade outside the dollar. And that, I was with those guys about two months ago, and they said, Chiara, they never imagined it to happen. But they said 10 to 18 years. It looks to them 10 to 18 months now. Right. So that the dollar is going to suffer, that's, that's true. And... Uh, the, the the people that are going to get burned is the American citizens. They are going to they are the ones that are going to suffer. Now there is a story that is uh, in the dungeons that there's about forty two countries that are sitting on dollar reserves, and they are apparently just waiting for the signal. And they dump those dollars. So, you know, how true it is, I wouldn't know. But the yeah. fact of the matter is, yeah. it is a reality that what the West did to has alerted other countries to their vulnerability with having their reserves in dollars. And uh, China, for instance, uh, they dropped their dollar reserves tremendously. But the Chinese sits in a peculiar place. They hold a hell of a lot of the American debt. So they can actually, the Chinese can actually overnight bankrupt America. Yeah. So that's a thing that you must keep in mind. Colleen, thank you. And um, look, I I agree with uh, just about everything you said. Um, the the one thing that interests me about the situation when it comes to the, um, the the BRICS proposed trading currency is that it's really taken the power away from the Bank of International Settlements, which is like the central bank of central banks, and yes. um, they are clearly in the court of uh, the Federal Reserve in the U.S. So you've now actually got the establishment of a huge um, competitive form of currency to what was a monopoly through the Bank of International Settlements in, in Switzerland. So I think this is a good thing because then it takes away their ability to, to gouge and, 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 you know, just take take money off the average person like you and me through interest rates and stuff like that. Now, I, I'm going to go across to Muzi. Muzi, do you have anything you'd like to add regarding um, these two different forms of, of trading money? I agree <coughs> Colleen and what he said about it all. Although, for me, I, I see no real benefit um, you know, with this whole BRICS thing for the average citizen. Now, the average citizen who is not a producer that is able to export anything, they would wonder, what do I get out of this? Why should I care about any of this? What is the practicality about me in this situation? Some will celebrate that, hooray, NATO will not have as much, as a, as much of a hold on us ever again because while the dollar is uh, slowly falling apart they can celebrate that but 
what about the average person, really, right? Because at the end of the day, it's hard for me to even celebrate what is happening with BRICS when I know they are not the friends of the average day citizen. We know that the all these people were all in one unity, one same team when the pandemic hit. They just did things their own way, but they followed the same template, really, right? Everybody had to get what they had to get, the juice. They had to shut everything down and small businesses were affected. So, and these were all BRICS countries as well. How can I have any positive uh, um, thoughts about them taking over now and us becoming a part of them when they did what they did to us? You know, it's, it's very hard for me to be positive or even care about it because they were capable of doing all that. And yeah, I, I agree with most of what was said earlier, but it's just, I, I see no value in this as for me personally or any other normal person. It's, you could say it's my fault. I can't produce a lot of things maybe, but technically no circumstance got in the way. I did what I could within the circumstance. And that's a lot of people. And I don't trust BRICS. BRICS is not the golden savior, as uh, Colin once said. They're here to do business. And if you not if you don't have anything to offer, well, you're not going to get anything. And many people don't have anything to offer. And BRICS countries made sure that many more people don't have anything to offer when they decide to shut everything down. And so how can I ignore what China has done with the social credit score? You know, how do we know that they wouldn't want to implement that here? We, we don't necessarily know. Um, NATO can die for all we care. Too bad for the Americans. They have it coming. But at the end of the day, it's not like we are going to be uh, in a better place either, per se. So, eh, it, it's, I, I, don't, I don't see any celebrations to be had. Um, with all of this at all. Right. Just go on. Yeah, go ahead, I Colin. To, I want to respond to something he said. Yeah, okay, go ahead. First of all, he makes the statement that the BRICS countries did the same as the other when it came to the pandemic. All right. Now, what I want to tell him is ask him, do you, do you know what happened to the president of Tanzania? Yeah, he got assassinated. Why? Because he spoke against the scam. Uh huh. Yeah, and then a day later he was replaced with a puppet. Uh huh. So yeah. the African countries, they are. 100% under control of the cabal. When you go to Russia, there was, I read somewhere, and I'm, I can be out, uh, a thousand or 10,000 uh, doses of Pfizer was used in Russia before they stopped it. The Russians developed their own thing, that Sputnik thing, which is not mRNA. The Chinese side, this is going to be shock, be a shocker to many people. The Western media made a massive story of the strict lockdown processes and procedures in China. Now, I'm going to give you something to think about. The Chinese under the smoke screen of the snake bite, prepare their nation for biological warfare. They are most probably the only nation in the world that is physically prepared for biological warfare. That's the one thing. Then you mentioned 
the social credit score. I think, and I'm going to assume, that you don't know much about China. I speak I know. to people that live in China, that live in China, that's been living there for 18 years. And one night we were in a debate and I said to the guy, what is it? just tell me, what is this story about this social credit score? And he said, you know, I'm so tired of explaining it to people, but the reality is, you must understand, a city like Shanghai, 45 million people in one city, how the hell must they handle law and order with humans only? They are using technology. And he said, what happens there is, say for instance, you cross the street where you're not allowed to do it. Camera pick you up, and immediately that fine is on your tab. You can go to the authorities and appeal it and say, yeah, yeah, I had to run over here because there was somebody on the other side trying to kill a cat or something like that. And explain, and then it's okay. So all their petty crimes, jaywalking and Things like that, petty crimes, are collected by these things. Now, you live in Nelspruit. Take your car and drive through from Brown, down from Brown, and then you go into the CBD, and then you go to Riverside, and check how many cameras are there watching you. Do you know how many cameras are actually watching you? A few. Have you seen them? Yes, I have. Yeah. That's, yeah. Okay. They're everywhere. So people in the West make a hell of a story of the Chinese are being so monitored. Okay. That is to make their society work. And that guy said to me something that, and he said, this is something that the West don't ever talk about. Kalein. He said, you must understand. This is not integrated across the country. Yeah. All of these things work in isolation in the communities where they need it. And then that digital coin that they're talking about, the central digital coin, whatever thing, people are scared of that thing. The thing that you must be scared of is the programmable one coming from the cabal. Yeah. But the ones that they're using... Russia has just launched a digital ruble. Now, now, Kalein, I, I just want to go back to Muzi because he was actually talking. <laughs> so if we can go back to Muzi, go, go ahead with what uh, you were saying. I also spoke to a person living in China. He's been living there for eight years. And um, all the concerns that I raised about what the Chinese did, perhaps the social credit score, um, maybe it was stretched. Uh, but I still think they could take it an extra step. But things such as the necessary shutdowns in which the government demands that even if there's an earthquake, stay within your houses. This is something he witnessed. This is something, the, the harsh shutdowns that he had to go through in which if there's one person in the building who tests positive or shows signs by coughing, they'll lock down the whole, um, the whole building. And many times he was close to starving to death. He said, anyone who's sick and tests positive and has a pet, the pet will be killed. I don't even know if he's alive right now. I, I don't know. Last time I spoke to him, it was a year ago. He showed me the, the, the normal diet that the Chinese do have. We thought, we thought we, it is sensationalism that, hey, they don't really eat bats and all that. He showed me all the pictures, the, the, the wet markets right there eating all sorts of weird things so yeah china is not perfect and the way they treat their people is awful and what they did to hong kong by trampling on the hong kong's well desire to stay uh, a democracy well who's who's to say china can't do that to anybody else i cannot trust the chinese at all 
we see what they're doing to a few Zimbabweans and um, Ghanaians in their factories, treating them like slaves. Well, a lot of them deserve to be treated like that, but at, at the end of the day, they still do it. So it's like, hey, um, I don't know if these guys are our friends over here, so I cannot celebrate. And heck, the fact that you just said that Russia has created their own digital uh, ruble, for what? Why? Aren't we just going to... I thought we were going to use actual commodities in the real world, right? Base it all on gold. What's this digital stuff for? Because the narrative that it can be stretched and used for control and this and that, well, the evidence is in the pudding. We see it. So I cannot trust them because even though they might have thrown out the snake bite that had the mRNA in it, they still followed the lie that this thing that you have a 99 survival rate, uh, you know, chance of surviving, they still said you need to get the bite. And it's like, but if I have a 99.99 survival rate, why do I need to get it? The gaslighting. They participated in the gaslighting, and that's what makes me say, I can't trust them. Yeah. Because that gaslighting really fried a lot of people's brains. Yeah. Okay, guys, look, we've been going for nearly two hours. I mean, we just just for everybody who's watching, we have these discussions with Kalein and Muzi monthly. So we cover a whole range of topics, and there was a whole lot of stuff that I was hoping to cover tonight, which we just don't have time to cover. Um, but just, just then, before we wrap up this live stream, I just want to remind you, Friday night, that's this Friday night at 8 p.m. Um, Johannesburg time, I'm going to be talking about the history of and the origins and the, 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 the two different aspects of these two huge bank accounts which everybody's talking about. The white spiritual boy and the spiritual young boy, which are basically infinite accounts, as they call them, around the world. And it's a very, very interesting story. That's happening 8 p.m. Johannesburg time, Friday night. Um, what I will be doing is I'll be going down the rabbit holes. I'll be showing you PDFs which talk about the subject. We will expose who the actual owner of the bank accounts are. And you'll be surprised to know that he actually comes from the Philippines. And um, we'll be talking about a whole lot of stuff, the impact on the World Bank with these bank accounts. It's an extraordinary story. That's Friday night, 8 p.m. Johannesburg time. And I will be making those PDFs, which I'll be showing, available to people through our forum on lovinglifetv.com. So if you want to download these PDFs, which are documents put together by um, people who claim to be the owners of these two huge bank accounts which have amounts of money which go way beyond quadrillion and you, when you when you look at money you've got uh, million billion trillion you've got quadrillion they go up to about 25 to 30 zeros before you get to the number at the front um, this is this is an amazing story and uh, as I say I've been doing a lot of research on it and there'll be a lot of information if you're interested in the subject because basically uh, the suggestion is is that the whole banking system is based on these two accounts which are found apparently in banks around the world with huge sums of money in them so that's Friday night 8 p.m. Johannesburg time all right I'm gonna go back to our guests now and guys look we, we've had a really interesting discussion and what I'd like to do is wrap this one up. We will have one next month, of course, where we will go through other subjects. Um, I'm, I'm going to go to Muzi first. Muzi, is there something you'd like to say in just wrapping up uh, this live stream? Uh, yeah, I, as I said earlier, I took a backseat ride in focusing what's happening around the world, around the country, because I felt like there's nothing I can do about it. And I understand why young people don't want to participate because they too feel hopeless and they see us having these conversations and maybe make fun of us and say, look at these guys. They're talking about things they can't change. And some of us did try to make a difference before things got 
as tight as it is, but we were surrounded by idiots uh, who never wanted to actually be responsible and get involved in anything. But as we are right now, you know, it's like, I, it's just a me thing. I, as a, a young person, I, I just like to be part of something that actually makes a difference in the real world. I appreciate these conversations because I get to, uh, you know, flex my brain and actually think because a lot of people I interact with, they don't have a brain, you know. So just by surrounding myself with them, I just might lose my own brain. So I appreciate this. Um, and yeah, I just wish there was more practical things we could do on the ground because clicking like and subscribe and all these things, it doesn't really do anything for the masses. And I just wish more people would be unafraid to, to call out the savages on their love of witchcraft and evil and just do so even in the real world, you know, even if there are consequences, it must be done. Because if we know better, let's do better. And the bare minimum is to call the idiot in the street and say, hey, stop being an idiot. Um, stop being satanic. Stop following these stupid things. And it might sound or feel hopeless to you that what's the point? If you believe that, what's the point of watching this video? You know, this is not entertainment. Let everybody who watches this while they have a box of popcorn on the side feel ashamed. We're not here to entertain you. We're here to inspire you to go and actually uh, address the evil in your community. Don't just watch and eat popcorn and that's it. We're not puppets, you know, we're real people who want to see a change here and we've done what we can. Have you tried? So please, try, try and resist the evil. Don't let the morons get away with everything. Don't let the savages get away with anything. There might be consequences, but at least it's the right thing to do. Otherwise, well, you know, different, are you? You know, so, yeah, that's what I have to say. Fantastic. Um, over to you, Kalan, just to wrap up. Yeah, well, oh, what can I say? I tell the truth. I say things that uh, many people are too scared to say. The thing is this, that we have been put into a groove where we swallow the egg with our tasty in it. We just take it. And, yeah, you must not make a mistake. I get a lot of I don't want to call it hate mail. <laughs> I don't want to call it fan mail. I get a lot of fan mail. <laughs> what, what, what about and your What about your Nazi? Is he still on your ba your case? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, uh, <laughs> I'm handling him. I'm handling him at arm's length. Uh, I've decided that I'm giving him a lot of ego masturbation by mentioning his existence. <laughs> so, the fact of the matter is that, in the end, all I ask is, think about these things. Just stop thinking about it. Because, uh, the big, I think the biggest problem is that people have lost that natural inquisitiveness. They just take it in as they're being fed. And that is the reason why a lot of people took that shot. And they today they they want to rip their hair out and rip their nails out and rip their what off and whatever. They can do nothing about it. Uh, so this you know, there's now a group of people that say that those that didn't take we're not aggressive enough in stopping them to take it. They're talking bullshit. I mean, we, the, we the guys, the pure blood guys, we, were, we went through hell. I mean, we were under pressure like crazy. And 
not me so much, but I mean, there were people in Scotland there first and experience of it. People lost their jobs and lost their income and lost their whatever. And so the pressure was tremendous. But for me now, I actually enjoy some of my skid marks, making them, just putting the facts out there. And I don't care whether your IQ is 65 or 140. A fact is a fact. And the, your level of IQ is not going to change that fact. Whether you can comprehend whatever is tied on to that, that's not my problem. I've got a saying, and my wife has been on my case about it, and I said, Moses 6, verse 6, is clear. Stupid people must suffer. And that's the end of the story. So, in the end, what you do, Scott, is you're giving a platform where people can speak freely. And unfortunately, there's a hell of a lot of large percentage of our population they can't handle free speech. <laughs> free speech has become dangerous to them. And they are being protected by the cabal. And they give the cabal the, the, the you know, they, they, the reason to curtail spe free speech because it's damaging to them. Yeah, and, and their agenda. Yeah. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining me tonight. I look forward to our next live stream next month. And... Uh, you know, it's it's always fascinating to get two different perspectives on different subjects. And probably next month, we might focus a little bit more on the upcoming 2024 elections in South Africa. But uh, there's certainly other things we'll be talking about as well. Take there's care. something I want to say, Scott. Yeah, go ahead, Kale. Uh I understand Musi's uh, feeling towards Brits. I understand it 100%. And I have said it in many of my skid marks. South Africa hasn't got a lot to contribute to BRICS because we are not a producing country anymore. We've lost our industrial base and uh, all of that. Uh, and, the, the, and I've said it many times. Nobody got us into BRICS. We were pulled into BRICS for the Cape Sea route and that was, that was the main drive. And now we're sitting with a situation there's a lot of new countries coming into BRICS. And all of a sudden, South Africa, at this point in time, South Africa has got a special position at that BRICS table because it's one of the, let's call it, founding members. But that importance is going to diminish now very rapidly. Because as, I, as I've said in some of my skid marks, that uh, BRICS is about growing the countries that are part of those of that block and if you are in a country where your political leadership condones genocide you are actually an embarrassment for the other, other leaders in BRICS because they don't want to hear those stories because they've been through some of them has been through actual genocides. Mm. And the, the, this is the thing that I, my personal opinion is that uh, South Africa's prominence in BRICS, the South African light in BRICS is going to dim very quickly after this conference. Well, well Colin, the S could become Saudi Arabia, couldn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Many people say that and so forth. Uh, I think in the end, there are so many S countries mm. that it's not really going to. Uh, I think, I think after after this uh, uh, meeting that's going to happen now, uh, the focus on the meaning of the BRICS is going to diminish, and it will become what it is, an acronym, and that's it. Right. Now, Muzi, seeing that um, Colleen 
just responded to what is there anything you want to say or are you ready to to sign off uh i'll just say if people want peace um they should repent and understand their bible because all that is happening now it's part of prophecy and i know others have ill feelings about it but you see the whole picture and that should give you relief because you can get so caught up in all the logistics of everything. But yeah. when you see everything from a bird's eye view, then there's a bit of relief, you know? So let's not all get in this frenzy of like, oh no, what's gonna happen next? Relax and repent. And whatever happens, it happens. So that's all. Okay, wise words. Thank you so much, Muzi. Colleen, thank you guys for joining me tonight and uh, we'll see you next month. Okay, Scott, thank you. Great evening. Good night, Mushi, and all the people still watching. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> I think they did. <laughs> we, we've had a very retentive audience, if I can put it that way. All right, guys, take care and good night. Cheers. All right, guys, that was Muzi and Corsi and uh, Colleen Serfontaine, Ooh. also known as Skidmarks, uh, a good friend of the Loving Life channel. And uh, I'm now going to go out, as usual, with one of our um, uh, theme songs. And, of course, that would be um, Hier Blei Ek Boer. So give me a second while I just get that up. Have a great evening. And before I do go, thank you to the moderators for the great work that you do. Um, I did notice there was a little bit of controversy about some post that was made. And, guys, hey, you know... <laughs> we have a, we had a lot of people on tonight, so um, I think everybody enjoyed it, and let's focus on that. Here comes here Blay Akbur, and I hope to see you tomorrow night, and of course Friday night, where I'm going to be talking about these two incredibly big bank accounts, their origins, whether they exist, and there's a lot of stuff in there that's going to make you say, "What the?" Mm -hmm. Okay. Take care, guys, and see you tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Here comes, Hier Blei Ek Boer. Meer as 61,000 van ons voorvaars het op grens ons gesterwe, so ons verreik aan ons. Die is my land, die is my weg, hier is Ek Boer. Ek gemaak en sal ek terugkeer Die bybel is die woord waaruit ek leer Soos die grond op die aarde Hier bly ek boer Soos die diep in die nacht sal die vijand kom Maar hier bly ek staan en ek draai nie om Want jy maak my nie bang nie Hier bly ek boer Die is my land waarvoor ek sal vaar Die is my bloed, my sweet, my rug Die is die plek waar my voorvaders leer Die is my land waar my land Wat vreeg te bring My opa wat maan Ek hier ook kon sing Soos hy staf Deer die lande Hier was hy boer My wortels Leek diep in die grond geplant Hy sien soos my pa Los ek vir jou die land En jy hoef nie te vrees nie Hier sal jy boer Die is my land Waarvoor ek sal vaar Die is my bloed My sweet, my rug Die is die plek Waar my voorvaders leef Die is my land Voor my dek jou sê Die is my land Wat my mense voor Yeah.